So most people, when they think of a space station, they think of the ISS, right? The International Space Station. Um, Big, collaborative. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of the default image. But there's actually another one up there. China's Tiangong, the Heavenly Palace. It's been operational since, what, 2021? That's right, 2021. And it doesn't get nearly as much coverage, especially in Western media. Which is interesting because when you start digging into what they're actually doing up there, right. it seems pretty ambitious. It really does. And, you know, it contrasts quite a bit with the ISS. The ISS is very broad international science. Tiangong, mm. well, it feels much more focused focused how so like what's the main goal is that what we're trying to figure out today that's the core question yeah what's china really aiming for with this heavenly palace okay maybe we should back up a bit first give a little history this isn't their first attempt is it no definitely not the program really kicked off with tiangong one back in 2011. tiangong one that was the uh the simpler one right like a tube yeah pretty much just over 10 meters long two solar panels think of it as um Space Station 101. Uh-huh. Right. Learning the ropes. Exactly. Mastering rendezvous, docking, you know, getting two spacecraft to actually meet and connect precisely in orbit, and yeah. just figuring out how to live up there, even short term. And it worked. They had crews visit. Oh, yeah. Both crewed and uncrewed missions docked successfully. It was only up there for, what, under seven years, but it did its job. It proved they could do it. It absolutely did. That initial success was vital. It showed capability and, you know, let them move on to the next step. It's that classic incremental approach. Start small, learn, then scale up. Okay, so step two was Tiangong 2. Yep. Launched in 2016. This one wasn't meant to be permanent either. Its main job was field testing key technologies for the big station they planned later. Like a dress rehearsal for the main event? Sort of, yeah. Testing the systems needed for a long-term presence. Once those tests were done, they deorbited it in 2019. Okay, mission accomplished. And that leads us to the current Tiangong, sometimes called Tiangong 3. That's the one. And this is where things get, well, a lot more complex and interesting. How so? What's different about this one? Well, first off, it's modular. Unlike the first one, which was launched pretty much as is, this one was built piece by piece in orbit. Uh, like the ISS was. Exactly. You've got the main core module, the Tian, that's the living space. Okay. Then they added two science modules, Wenqin and Mengqin. Wenqin and Mengqin, what do they do? Wenqin is focused on life sciences, medical tech, basically how space affects living things. Yeah. Mengqin is more about microgravity, physics, fluids, combustion, material science, that kind of stuff. Gotcha. And it's got like solar panels and robotic arms. Yep. Big rotating solar arrays to get maximum power and an external robotic arm, which is pretty crucial for spacewalks and maintenance. So how big are we talking? Is it comparable to the ISS? It's smaller, definitely. About 100 tons, maybe 55 meters long. The ISS is much bigger. But Tiangong can still host up to six Taikonauts, which isn't insignificant. And remember, it was all assembled up there, module by module, between 2021 and 2022. Pretty impressive feat. Absolutely. What's life like for the Taikonauts? similar to ISS astronauts. From what we know, yeah, pretty similar in many ways. They've got a surprising variety of space food. Mm. I heard something like 120 different kinds. 120, wow. wow. Better than airline food, I hope. One would hope. Yeah. And of course, daily exercise is absolutely critical to counter muscle and bone loss and microgravity. Standard procedure. Right. But something that stands out with Tiangong is their outreach, especially with schools in China. Oh, yeah. What kind of things? They do live video lessons, demonstrations. I saw one about how fire behaves in zero-G, which is pretty cool for kids to see. Definitely. And they even get students involved in experiments, like growing rice seeds simultaneously on Earth and on the station to compare the effects of microgravity. That's a great way to get kids interested in science. Totally. Plus, they have dedicated plant life support systems on board, which fits with those experiments. Okay, so daily life, science demos, student experiments, Sounds like a functioning space station. Mm. But you mentioned earlier it feels more targeted. Yes. Beyond these, let's call them more familiar activities, there seem to be five core research themes driving the work on Tiangong. And these themes, when you look at them together, they really hint at something much bigger. Okay, I'm intrigued. Five things. Let's break them down. What's the first one? The first is on-orbit assembly and construction technologies in space. On-orbit assembly? So building stuff in space, not just launching it whole. Exactly. Developing the tech to build really large structures, maybe even entire spacecraft, right there in orbit. 
Why would they do that? It seems complicated. Well, think about launching something enormous and complex from Earth. It's incredibly expensive, you need massive rockets, and every launch carries risk. Ah, okay, so building it piece by piece up there, avoid some of that. That's the idea. Set up raw materials or smaller components and assemble or even manufacture things in space. There was a paper in 2023 outlining goals for things like 3D printing tools specifically for orbit. 3D printing in space. Yeah, yeah. and they've already done some pioneering work. Back in 2018, they were actually the first to successfully 3D print ceramics in microgravity. Ceramics? Huh. Fits with China's history, I guess. It does, kind of amusingly. But the point is, if you can make parts, or even use resources found in space eventually. You mean like mining asteroids or the moon? That's the in-situ resource utilization thing. Exactly. Using what's already there instead of hauling everything up from Earth. It's a potential game changer for costs and logistics. They're also looking at things like inflatable, scalable structures. Inflatable, like space tents. Kind of like that, yeah. But think bigger habitats on the moon or Mars that you could deploy and expand. Yeah. Building in space opens up those possibilities. Okay, that's a big one. Building in orbit, what's theme number two? Space robotics and autonomous system technology. Makes sense. If you're building things, you probably want robots helping out. Precisely. Robots are ideal for repetitive tasks, dangerous repairs, construction assistance, moving cargo around, tasks you maybe don't want humans doing all the time, especially outside the station. Less risk for the Taikonauts. Right, and just like automation boosts efficiency in factories on Earth, the same principle applies in space. They're actively testing robots in microgravity. There was footage of one navigating inside a pipe, for example. So developing smart, capable robots is key. Absolutely crucial for any kind of large-scale, long-term space activity, especially construction or maintenance. It reduces the burden on the crew. Okay, building in space, robots to help. What's next? Theme three. New energy and propulsion technology. Energy and propulsion. Okay, so power and getting around, they have solar panels, right? They do, and solar works great in Earth orbit. But uh, if you're thinking about missions going further out, say to Jupiter or beyond. Sunlight gets pretty weak out there. Exactly. Remember NASA's Juno mission to Jupiter? It's solar powered, but it only gets about 3% of the sunlight we get here on Earth. Mm -hmm. It needs huge panels. So relying only on solar has its limits if you want to go deep space. Right. So the fact that they're actively researching other energy options and also new propulsion technologies, it strongly implies they're thinking about projects much further away than just Earth orbit or even the moon. What kind of propulsion challenges are there for long trips? The biggest one is fuel. Conventional rockets need a massive amount of propellant, which you have to launch from Earth, adding huge weight and cost. Which ties back into that in-situ resource idea again, right? Making fuel out there. It does. And it also pushes the need for propulsion systems that are maybe less powerful in terms of immediate thrust, but way more efficient over long periods. Things that sip fuel but can run for months or years. Like ion drives? Like ion drives or other advanced concepts. High efficiency, long life. That's what you need for serious solar system exploration. Okay, so we've got building, robots, power, and propulsion for going further. What's theme four? This one's critical for long stays. Environmental control and life support system technology. ECLSS for short. Ah, the basics. Breathing, drinking, eating. Pretty much. If you're planning really long missions or setting up outposts somewhere, you absolutely cannot rely solely on resupply ships from Earth bringing water, oxygen, and food. It's just not sustainable. You need to be self-sufficient. Exactly. So they're doing a lot of research into closing the loop, recycling air and water with extremely high efficiency, growing food in space. Like the rice experiments we mentioned? Yes, that's a perfect example. And managing waste effectively. They're even studying things like fruit flies over multiple generations to see how microgravity affects life long term. But is there anything really groundbreaking here. Recycling tech has been around on stations for a while. Well, this is where it gets really interesting. They conducted an artificial photosynthesis experiment on Tiangong. Artificial photosynthesis, like right. making air like plants do. Sort of, yes. They used a semiconductor catalyst to take carbon dioxide, which astronauts exhale, and convert it into oxygen and a hydrocarbon called ethylene. Whoa, okay, oxygen is obviously useful. What about ethylene? Ethylene could potentially be used to create rocket fuel. Mm. And the researchers think they could tweak the process to make other useful things too. Methane, maybe even basic sugars, essentially mimicking what plants do, but potentially more efficiently for certain outputs. How does it compare to, say, the system on the ISS? 
Well, the main oxygen generation system on the ISS uses electrolysis, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Apparently, that uses a lot of power, maybe a third of the station's total energy budget. A third? Wow. This artificial photosynthesis method, according to the reports, is significantly more energy efficient, it gets rid of CO2 directly, and it works at room temperature. That sounds like a pretty big deal for long duration missions. It could be revolutionary. Less power drain, producing fuel components, yeah. using up waste CO2. It ticks a lot of boxes for self-sufficiency. Okay, that's huge. What's the fifth and final theme? The last one is new generic technology for spacecraft. Sounds a bit vague. <laughs> generic technology. It does sound broad, but it's actually really fundamental. Mm -hmm. It basically means thoroughly testing uh, all the hardware pumps, valves, electronics, materials, everything to make absolutely sure it works reliably in the unique environment of space. Because things behave weirdly up there? Exactly. Microgravity does strange things, especially to anything involving fluids. Fluid dynamics are incredibly hard to model perfectly on Earth for space conditions. Plus, you have vacuum, temperature swings, radiation. So you just have to test it for real. You really do. Yeah. Simulations and ground tests are essential, but there's no substitute for seeing how a gear actually performs over time in orbit. It's about building confidence in your systems before you bet a mission on them, maturing the technology. Okay, so let's recap the five themes. Building big things in orbit. Mm -hmm. On orbit assembly. Using robots for help. Space robotics and autonomy. Developing new power and propulsion for longer distances. In energy and propulsion, yeah. Creating self-sufficient life support, including that artificial photosynthesis. Advanced ECLSS. And rigorously testing all the basic gear. Generic spacecraft tech validation. Right. When you put all five together like that, it really does paint a picture, doesn't it? It's not just about running a space station. Not at all. Yeah. These aren't just five separate research projects. They connect. They point towards a coherent, long-term vision. Which is? Which seems to be building the foundational capabilities needed for a much larger, potentially self-sustaining human presence throughout the solar system. Like a network of habitats, mm. mining operations, bases on moons and planets. That seems to be the implication. Having the ability to build large structures in space, using robots, powering them efficiently, maybe using local resources, keeping people alive indefinitely, that's the toolkit you'd need for that kind of future. It answers that initial question we had, what's the primary goal? It seems less about just low Earth orbit and more about enabling exploration and settlement further out. That's certainly how it looks when you connect these research dots. It's ambitious. No, obviously it's still early days. China isn't the only player in space exploration. Absolutely not. Lots of exciting work happening globally. But the fact that they're already testing things like manufacturing capabilities in space, it suggests maybe those future platforms, those habitats or factories, aren't purely science fiction in their planning. It definitely suggests they're taking the prerequisites very seriously. Testing the enabling tech now implies the applications might not be generations away. What about collaboration? Is Tiangong a purely Chinese project or are others involved? Well, China has stated they're open to international collaboration. They've actually invited scientists worldwide to propose experiments for Tiangong. But are there international astronauts visiting? Like on the ISS? Not currently, no. There are some hurdles. Mm. For instance, U.S. law, the Wolf Amendment, effectively prevents NASA collaboration, including astronauts visiting Tiangong, without specific congressional approval. Ah, right. Politics getting in the way. Seems so. In Europe, the European Space Agency initially had plans, or at least discussions, about sending astronauts. Uh. But they formally backed away in early 2023, citing budget constraints and well, the political climate as well. So despite the open invitation, it's mainly Taikonauts up there doing this work right now. Primarily, yes, which raises a big question, really. Will other nations eventually find ways to collaborate on these potentially groundbreaking experiments? Or will China pursue this vision largely on its own? The potential benefits of sharing knowledge seem huge, especially for something this ambitious. You'd think so. Faster progress, shared costs, but international partnerships are complex. Okay, so summing up the big picture from Tiangong, we're seeing serious work on artificial photosynthesis for life support. Yeah, potentially game-changing. Building large structures in orbit, not just launching them. Orbital construction. Using resources found in space. In situ resource utilization. Advanced robotics working alongside humans. He enabler. And new ways to power missions deep into the solar system. New energy and propulsion, yeah. It really feels like, like maybe we're entering a new phase of space exploration altogether. I mean, a new phase. 
While for a long time, space travel was about visiting, go to the moon, plant a flag, collect rocks, come home, go to Mars with a rover, point A to point B and back, essentially. Right. Sorties out from Earth. Exactly. Yeah. But the kind of research happening on Tangong focused on self-sufficiency, manufacturing long-term habitats. Yeah. It points towards a future where humanity might actually, you know, leave the nest, mm -hmm. establish a sustained presence beyond Earth. Moving out, not just visiting. Precisely. Developing the capability to live and work sustainably off-planet for the long haul. That's a pretty profound shift in thinking. Mm -hmm. And it makes you wonder, with all this foundational work being laid, partly on Tiangong, are we, as a species, really ready for everything that implies this next era of actually moving out into the solar system? And that's the big question to ponder, isn't it? Yeah. Are we ready for what comes next? 